Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started with the second part of our session. Um, I have uploaded, if anyone wants to have it and play with it, the Starfleet building mass. Uh, just kind of out there in the uh, Canvas server, so you can go ahead and take that. Actually, let me upload one other thing while I'm thinking about it. Let me go and uh, put the profile out there too. That way you have all the little pieces if you want to try and build this at home. Okay, so we have both the profile and the building mass that got assembled out of them. So let me go ahead and share that. Super. So you can start putting that together. But what I would like to do is go through and use that now, since we constructed a really groovy looking uh, kind of building profile, and try to run some of the analysis against it. So what we're going to do is just take that and just load it into that Revit project, and then just try going after, oh, things like the volume and the surface area. That's real easy to get at. But the ones that I want to sort of look at in particular are, first we'll start with the whole cost and that whole issue of the variable cost by floor. And then we'll talk about the EUI, or the energy, total energy, or you know, whatever we want to do with it. Okay, So let's go ahead. I'm going to load this into my project. It'll sort of be over here somewhere. And I'll drop it in my landscape <laughs> of buildings. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting city now. Okay. I'll get rid of some of these other ones just because it will slow us down as we're working. Okay, and again, the issue is I want to go through and actually I should make sure that's down on level one. I think it should have been placed there, but you're never quite sure. Uh, let me show masses. Oh, well, hang on. Where are you? I saw you in 3D. Okay, you're here. Let me go back to you. The elevations. It's probably just outside the range of something. There it is. Okay, it looks like it's down at level one. It's kind of off the screen a little bit. Beautiful. So let's go through and give this some uh, mass floors. The mass floors again are necessary so we can kind of compute all that information. And once again, grab more than the mass floors you need because you want the total range of you might, what you might need so that if this thing gets taller, you can go ahead and report the additional floor area. Okay, so that's looking pretty good there. Let me just go ahead and save that away. Just so I have it. <laughs> Okay, the idea is we are going to set up a little dynamo script to go ahead and flex, for example, the height, but we can flex that twist, or the height and the twist. We can do any of those things, but we'll keep it simple for today. We're just going to flex the height to kind of uh, give us the idea of really the flexing. I think you're in pretty good on shape, good shape on. It's really just uh, how we go through and pull the values back out. So let's go ahead and go to dynamo. And we're going to open up a script. I'm going to advise that we're going to kind of walk through it. Don't run it just yet, because right now it's hooked up, so it'll also try to do the energy analysis, which takes some time. So I'm going to basically go through, we're going to disable, we're going to unhook the energy analysis, just so we can sort of see the other parts first. And then we'll get to the energy analysis of the last piece. So go through, and where do I want it to be? It's going to be, um, let me find it, under 18. Let's go to, which one is it? It's the dynamo. D-Y-N. Must be fine mass area floors. Yeah. Which is where I started building this example. So it's unfortunately named, but it'll work. OK. We're going to do a couple things in here. You'll see at the high level, this is like a really simple sort of script. It's really just a list map that's going to go through a couple of different variations <coughs> on the top height. Oh, I think on ours we might have called it tower height. So we'll change that. We're going to select the model element and just pull out the gross floor area as a starting point. So let's kind of just put that together. I'm going to say let's select the model element and grab that guy. If I can pan that around back there just so we sort of get a better view of what's going on. 
up in something weird right now. I'll figure out what it is in a second. Let me close the dynamo again. Well, you're back now. Are you back? No? Okay. Hopefully that's not happening to you. I'll try that again. Again, let's see what's going to happen here. No, no mouse there. I wonder if it's all tied up in my bad mouse. Pan that over just so we can sort of see it. Open up Dynamo again. Looks like Dynamo is still open doing something. Maybe not. Okay, let's open that up again. Again, I think we're going to be good. Select that area. Okay, that part looks better. In terms of the variable, let's see what it's called over here. We called it tower height. So as opposed to top height, we'll change that to tower height. Just so we're looking good over there. Now don't run this just yet. Let's just kind of walk through it. And we'll disable that energy node. But at a high level, you can sort of see what's going on here. Even here, I'm going to start relatively modest. Just go like two or three floors. I'm not going to go hog wild because as I'm debugging, I don't like to like wait a long time. So let it fail on one or two. You don't need it to fail on ten. So let's take what's happening in here. Tower report floor data is a custom node that has a bunch of stuff in there. We just set that up so we can list map our way through it. And if you open that, what you're going to see is that what we're feeding in the element, we're feeding in the input values and the parameter name. Okay, tower height and then it's just going to go rotate through. So this stuff should look pretty familiar. When we come down into the node, let's take a look in here. This one's all set up with a lot of color coding. Let me kind of walk you through. Actually, even here, just before I forget and kind of run this by accident, go ahead and break it right there. Just take off that little purple node because I don't want to run that energy stuff just yet. But we'll walk through this. So it's all starting up here. This part should look pretty familiar. What happens up at the top is we grab the input or the model element itself, and I grab the input parameter name and the input parameter value. Transaction start, transaction end. So get the new value and for tower height, the name. Okay, it's going to go through and put the values in 110, 100, yeah, do all that. Super. After transaction end, so after it updated the Revit model, since we needed to change, we're going to go out and get some things. Okay, the simplest thing to get is probably just the get parameter value by name. So when we say get gross floor area, it just goes over, finds the gross floor area, and reports that out. So that first part, up through the blue, we have seen before. And... If you just want to try and run that and make sure everything is looking good, you can go ahead and even let me just sort of uh, remove one item from the list. So the only thing going through is the gross floor area. I even have this uh, returning the mass floor area sort of disabled <coughs> right now in terms of reporting it. I can take that off too if I want to. Okay, but basically, at this point, we're only going to just flex it and see if we can get the floor areas out. So that should be a real easy kind of test. Let's go back over here. Let's give it a run and see if we can get that part. Again, I always like to start modestly and then like kind of build up from it. And we'll see how this works. Oh, it's, this is interesting. This is, I always do this. 
I have the mod the modified the mass is still selected back there. The other side, the modified mass is still showing green, so it's waiting on you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I gotta do is just come back over to Revit and click away. And then it'll give permission to start. And you can see our tower growing ever so modestly. And you'll see we have these different sort of floor areas reported. So so far so good. That's pretty much as expected. Yes? Why is the tower growing or moving? Isn't this just analyzing it? Is what it it's doing is we have to get it to grow and move so we can pull the value out. So uh, we're using Revit as a calculator, and we say, okay, you, Revit, you understand all that geometry. Go through and flex that thing as necessary. Okay, and then we'll just kind of keep on reporting out about, out of what it does. And that's a really common way of doing it. Now, there are other times when you do it all strictly mathematically, and that works too, and you don't need to work with Revit, but if you have a Revit form in the background and you're pushing and pulling that, that's just sort of an easy way to get at that stuff. Okay, so we got that. The next issue is we would like to get all these different floor areas over here and factor them by this weird cost equation that sort of says that as we move up and down the floors, things cost a little bit different. So this up here looks like this floor has around 8,000 square feet. This floor down there has around 36,000 square feet. We'd like to be able to get that. The problem is gross floor area just gives us everything, so what we really need to do is grab the individual floors. Okay, and we started doing that right at the end of class last time. Where you do that is, or one way to approach that, is illustrated in a node that's called element mass floor areas. So what that node is, that's a custom node I put together that basically says, if you give me a mass element, I'm going to report out a list of all the different floor areas <coughs> associated with it. And let's just kind of take a look at what it does. If you edit that custom node, it's out there for you to work with, so please feel free to adapt this as you need. Let's see what it's going to do. It's going to bring in the mass element. And I bring in the mass element, and I actually just pass it right back out again. The reason I bring in the mass element, well, I need the element just a minute here. But I really want to make sure that I have the updated version of the element. So I really want to do something that would use the element, depend on it being updated before I did anything. Because otherwise, it would race ahead and give us the value for the first time. Yes, right. Let's see where that is. It's going to be, oh, mass floor mass. Ah, this is clockwork. something, is it from one box? Clockwork. It's from clockwork? Okay, let's see if we can find it. We just need to sort of load it in from somewhere else. That's one of these like ones that I grabbed. Let's see what we have in here. Mass floor. Where I'm hearing clockwork. If it's clockwork, we just need to download that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just we need to install that package and it'll work. All right. Okay. So here's the logic behind this one. We say, let us go through and do a couple things. Getting mass floors is actually something that you do. It's not an easy way to grab them. What you have to do is say, get me the category mass floor, get me all elements of that category. It'll give me all the mass floors in the model. And that would be pretty good. I went through and built in a little bit of a check here, though, to make sure I had the right mass floors. Because if I had a number of different masses, I could be grabbing mass floors from a bunch of different buildings that are out of the landscape. So what I said is, let's go ahead and use this thing, massfloor.mass, .mass, that identifies which mass the floor came from. Okay? And then I have the mass she passed in. Okay? I get the ID of each of those, because they all have these little unique ID numbers, and do a comparison that says, hey, is the mass floor host ID the same as the desired mass element ID? So just making sure they're in there. Because if I do that, I can do a little Boolean filtering to make sure that I'm only getting the floors that I want. Okay, so that's what this function's all about. It just basically goes through, it grabs all the mass floor IDs. After it figures out, are you true or false? Okay, it's going to use that as a mask, take all the mass floors, and just filter in or filter out the ones that match. And if they're in, the ins, I'm going to say, go down and get the floor area and get the level name. 
and then report those back out. Okay, so this whole function is just really all about going through and doing those mass floors. So, so the out gives you the false one. So what's that? The out would give you the false. Exactly. Okay. It'd be out of the list, <laughs> out of the pool. <laughs> okay, so let's go over here and just try running that. I'll come over back to tower report floor data and just connect in the mass. Again, I want the mass that's coming out of the transaction in because that's the one that has been updated. Okay, in just a minute, we're gonna take that list of floor areas and put a little cost equation on them. But for right now, let's just get those areas. Okay, let's go ahead and save that. I'll give it a run. Should look pretty similar. Maybe I'll go a little bit differently. I'll go from 150 to oh, 180 this time. This so it looks a little different. See it growing a little in the background there? Super. Let's check out what it's doing here. Looks like it's reporting a bunch of floor areas. That's actually still looking good. That's what I wanted. Let's go back and take a look at what's happening here. You'll see that the list of mass floor areas is returning a whole bunch of mass floor areas. Okay. These are all the different mass floor areas that are kind of currently in that model. You'll notice though, it actually has some extra stuff down in here. It has, oh, all these blanks. Those blanks are for basically floors that don't have mass to them. Yeah, okay, so they're just kind of hanging around empty there. But if I go down into this node, right over here, you'll see that how it evaluated was, there's an element 22, 229.694, all these came from element 229.654, so they're equal. Okay, this is an equal test. I actually should comment on that. You know, often you say like greater than equal or less than or equal to, that is equal equal is testing to something is unequal. And they're all true, so they're all filtering in and we're getting the floor areas out. So, so far so good. How would we get one false that's not to the desired element in uh, a, a setting? A very good question. Let's just test this to see if we can actually make that true. I think how that would work is, if we have like two elements or two forms in the project? Or? Yeah. yeah, mine right now is doing that because I left the Oh, you left twisting, the other twisting tower in. Yeah. I'm so like, there's, uh, I don't know. I'm going to put some floors on this one over there's here. About 50 falses to start, and it's because it's from the other tower. Oh, yeah. Cool. So, like for example, those would be in the false list right now. Got it, yeah. Because they're just kind of not part of the tower that I'm interested in. Okay, beautiful. So we go through and grab all those. We then take them on down and let's see what I actually do with those values. Because I have these values over here. In terms of actually coming up with some sort of metric, okay, here's what we're basically doing. You need some sort of formula that's basically going to relate them together. And I used a code block right here. Um, this has the cost at the bottom level, the cost at the top level, the total tower height, and the floor and floor <coughs> height, just really to figure out a linear relationship between the top and the bottom and where the intermediate points are. So actually, these aren't the right values. I know the 100 and 200 is things that I plugged in as I was doing some testing. You have, in the program brief, you have some description of the cost at level one, the cost at the highest level, and we can sort of adapt those. So if you look in the program, if anyone has it up, what are those values? I thought it, it's um, 500 per square foot at the bottom, at the ground level, yep. to 1,000 per square foot at 750. Okay, to 1,000. And then, yeah. And then we have our floor to floor height. Oops, let me fix that. 1,000. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, and the floor to floor height, <laughs> that's going to be whatever you've set. Yeah. And so, whether it's 15 feet or 10 feet, whatever it is. Okay, so great. This is going to say just basically take the cost at the bottom level to the cost at the top level, and then break into a number of increments, which is the tower height divided by the floor-to-floor -floor height. Okay, that'll be the number of increments plus one. 
Okay, and that's because you have zero and you have the top of the roof, so it's in there. So basically, this is returning a series of values, and the way this is going to work is zero is going to be if you're at level zero, the one value is going to be the cost at level one, the two is going to be at the cost of level two. So you're just going to scale it linearly. And a linear scale will work like this. If you have a kind of parabolic scale or something else, you can go through and kind of adjust that formula. Okay. What I'm going to do is basically say, hey, let's get this list of floor areas and this list of costs is get them together by multiplying them. Okay. Just to figure out it's basically a bunch of just factored floor areas. So uh, take all those floor areas. I got all my little floor areas, they're all calculating over here. To finish this up, I could get the cost of every floor and just return all those, but I decided, you know, what if I just gave you the total cost of the building as opposed to all those individual floors? So I wanted to do a math sum of those. So I got a list, I'll sum them. But we want to go through and put one other thing in, and that is this notion right here of uh, removing the nulls. And I think, again, that's a special function. Let's see where that one came from. But the issue is this list still has some nulls. Those nulls are the floors that don't have any area. Oh, the two, two high ones? Yes. 50. So they're the extras. So removing nulls is just saying, let's just reduce that so it only includes the ones that actually have values to them, and we can keep the sum on that. So where did math nulls come from, or remove nulls? Looks like it comes from lunchbox. So of course, I'm grabbing things all over the place, but <laughs> lunchbox and clockwork are your friends. OK, so go ahead and pull those in. You're looking good. Then when you return all that, let me zoom on out here. I can have this result or include that cost as one of the results. What I'll do is I'll add it into the list and I'll pull that up. So again, the way from a list map to get multiple values out of every iteration is to go ahead and stack the things up and then for every result add it into a list because since it can only return one thing, you can have it give you back a list of the different results. Okay, beauty. Save that away. Run that over here. So now we should get not only the total floor areas, but we should get some costs kind of hanging out over there too. Beautiful. So you'll see now, oh, for the different iterations, at 150 feet tall, it's going to be, oh, what is it? 177 million. At 180 feet tall, it's going to be 230 million. So you can use that same basic structure to go through and compute not only the costs, but you can also go through and use that to compute if you have a factored uh, sales value for each of the different floors. Okay. Same floor area, which is two different numbers to multiply by. Okay. So we'll get those numbers out for you. Okay. The last thing we want to talk about today that I'm going to show you is how you get the energy use data out of it. And it actually is not that bad. It's sort of straightforward, but let's kind of walk you through it. Again, how this works, if you've done energy analysis in Revit, is we typically say, here this is. Let's go over to analyze. And we create this energy model using some energy settings. Then we run a report that sends it over to Green Building Studio and runs a DOE 2.2 evaluation and computes some results for us. So that's the manual way of doing it. And we're pretty much doing the same thing here. Now, as we run our simulation, it's really just going to automate something happening here. So any energy settings you choose to put in there for the location, or for the uh, Lord of, well, for the location, for the building use, OK, um, what else? For the conceptual constructions. Even in here, if you do go through and adapt these, yeah, and you can set it up for the window to wall ratio. Any of these settings will apply to the energy analysis it's producing. Because it just re it, it's really just using the energy settings in the model. Okay, So you can adapt these if you want to. You can run that manual if you want to. 
But what I want to show you is how you actually get it to do it programmatically for you. Quick question on how you see the energy setting. Yes. Uh, when we click modify um, mass, it doesn't pop up. Is it a different download? Is it a different package? Also, it's in the analyze. It's in the analyze. Oh, it's in the analyze. Okay. Hey, go to the analyze tab. Got oh yeah. yeah. It's not, and then it's um, it's kind of buried around. It's, it looks like a like a pie chart that has a key. <laughs> So the main one we change is we change it to um, mass ellipse. Actually, mm -hmm. in terms of the scripting we're going to put in there, we're actually going to already change it. So as opposed okay. to building elements that says conceptual masses. But for you to make the changes, yeah, change that over. You know, okay. the window to wall ratio. You have all sorts of things in here about the conceptual constructions. That's the R values associated with the walls and the roof and things like that. Okay, so you can change any of those. You can do that programmatically too, but if you change them manually, it'll apply. And then the biggest things for you are probably, let's put it in San Francisco. Which has its own unique weather pattern. <laughs> Okay, even that's not very accurate because San Francisco has all these little microclimates, we're pretty close. And then if it's going to be, as opposed to, uh, like multifamily is probably the best use for what you're after, as opposed to office. And again, that's just gonna affect the assumptions about the density of the number of people per square foot, the operating hours, you know. Lighting power density. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Now, these things, they, what is it? Your comparative answer will be the same between all your options. This will affect the absolute number. Okay, but overall, the whole notion of comparatively how your different options stack up, if you keep the same set of settings, you know, you'll either have the same consistent error, or the same consistent bias built into the settings regardless. Okay, so we'll leave those hanging. Now, as opposed to running this manually to get it to run kind of more programmatically, go into the tower, report floor data, and it's the node that's way down at the bottom. And I'm gonna just walk you through it, and I'll run it as we're leaving, just because it takes a while to do it. Basically, for this node, we put together a node for you. Actually, Rami and I did this yesterday. Um, conceptual masses energy analysis. That's one of the nodes that's out there. And what it does is you basically give it a mass, so we'll pull down the mass that we've already deformed. It needs a couple different things. You're going to run a number of different cases, so I pass in a string, which is the input value you're putting in there, just so that all the different cases are easily distinguishable. So you can sort of see test case 100, test case 110, test case 120. So that's what that string's for. This uh, GBS project title string, that is when you go to Green Building Studio and look at it, the project has a name, so that name is the one that will show up there. Okay? And this directory path here, this is actually, this is the place where you want it to temporarily store files on your computer. So, if I go over here and I say, let's say, uh, so, test project in class. Okay. I'm going to store it in some directory path. I'm going to go to make a new folder, GB XML data in class. Say OK. And it's passing those things in. Those are all things that it just sort of needs to get going. Now don't run it just yet, because when you do run it, It'll check out for a while, because it takes a while to do it for the number of cases you do. Um, zoom on out. Let's go through and connect the mass. Again, what I want to connect is the finished mass, the transaction ended mass, not the original mass. And then for the input string or the case string, I'm just passing in the value of, uh, yeah, it's the input value right there. But let's take a look at this node, because this is the one you'll probably spend some time uh, modifying or playing with. It actually sort of works. Just so you know how the energy string works, it looks something like this. 
You give it a mass. You say, great, I want to go through and create, make a mass. And you say, I'm going to go through and divide that mass up and create mass levels. Now, you actually already have mass levels. Okay, so you don't need to redo that, but actually, Bit needs to do it in the program. We're going to take the mass and say, let's divide it up by the levels. Okay, and what that does is creates a bunch of different floor levels and zones. And if you've ever done that in Revit, you know, it's sort of, uh, it's basically doing this. You take that over there, and what it's going to do programmatically is, oh, it's regenerating over there. It's conceptual masses dot energy analysis. Oh, if you don't have these, yeah, nodes. If you're seeing red nodes here, <coughs> download the package. It's called Energy Analysis for Dynamo. Mm -hmm. What just happened there? Oh, there it is. So you'll see it's broken it up into kind of an energy model with a lot of windows in there. It's kind of having trouble with this one because it's kind of a funny shape. Mm -hmm. But again, download the package energy analysis for Dynamo. Bring that in. What's going to happen, let me just walk you through it before you uh, leave today. And we'll let it run. It's going to basically, this comes from um, the energy analysis for Dynamo, so create the mass levels. It's going to take the levels and you can either pass out all the mass families or the zones. I tend to like to work with zones. Because then if you have multiple buildings, it can kind of work together. What we're going to do is basically say you run the energy analysis by exporting the zone information as a GBXML file. That's how the whole thing is sending it out. All of this right over here is all about just creating a string from what you have. And even in terms of here, what you can do to really fix this, I know I still have uh, one error in this right now. <coughs> I need to have the directory passed in. I need to go through and put a slash on it before the name occurs. So if you want to fix this right now, it'll just put it in your desktop or it'll put it one level too high. What this string really needs to be, it needs to have a uh, backslash right in front of there. Because that'll say, take the directory and make it a file inside of that directory. Okay, so this all just concatenates together your directory, test case, 120.xml, that's just giving it a file name, so that you can create that file name. Once it goes through and creates that file, what you do is you run the energy analysis. Okay, so we have a title for the analysis, and we take the XML and we run the energy analysis. And then after the energy analysis is run, we get the results from the GD, uh, the global building or the Greenbuilding Studio server. Okay. And then we get these results out. Okay. And those results, there's a number of things you can sort of pull out of those. Right now, the results is a little bit of everything, but let me just kind of show you what you do have available to you. Let me say energy, oh, hang on, I'll pull it back out here. Under energy analysis for Dynamo, in terms of get analysis results, you have a lot of different things that are available to you. Probably the ones that are the most interesting are just, oh, the energy carbon cost summary. Because that one lets you pull out the annual energy cost, the life cycle cost, the amount of energy used. So what you can do is take those results and either in this node or you can pull it up to the higher node, just basically choose which of those different things are the numbers that you want to pull out. Okay, so. If you want to get the life cycle cost, you can pull that out and then take that out of the energy analysis results. Or you get the results, the whole thing, and pull them out, whatever one you want. So play around with this one a little bit. Start again with something small and relatively simple, but it'll run. It'll run pretty reliably. If it has any trouble at all, it usually just is that when it sends it to the Green Building Studio and you're telling it right here to wait, okay, this whole thing is whether you should wait for the results. If the Green Building Studio server is being slow, you may be waiting for it to run the iterations. Okay, but just as an example, before class, and what it was doing right at the beginning of class, is I was over in Green Building Studio. Let me get myself back in there again. Oh, 
Wow. So here was the session 18 test project that I was running before class. You can see that what it does is it creates a bunch of runs, 100, 110, 120. These are all my different runs that I was going through. And for each of these, it's reporting an EUI, it's reporting the electricity cost, the total cost, and your annual cost. It's, it's giving you all the data that you might want to pull out. Okay, so a little bit of playing around with that. And we should be able to kind of like uh, get our uh, energy data out of it. Okay. Let us pause there for today. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think the biggest thing would be to go through and get your building forms all looking good and flexy. If you have everything looking pretty good and you're getting all the costs out and some of that type of stuff, and you don't yet quite have any energy use, we can sort of fix some of those things on Tuesday when we're together yeah, and kind of finish it up. But the idea is Tuesday, we're really just going to compare notes on your interesting building forms and see where things are breaking and try and patch some of the holes around the edges. OK, super. Let us adjourn for today. For some reason